it's not just the calories that's important. But it's the way you eat it, it's the way you process it, and it's everything. It's not, everybody likes to say it's just about willpower. It's like, no, why you eat more is, is, is a state of your hunger, which is a state of your hormones. Why is what we eat and when we eat so important for our health? Well, I think what we eat, we, we, we talk a lot about that, right? So everywhere you go, people talk about it and there's always sort of disagreement. So you remember, you know, they used to be, oh, you have to eat low fat and you have to eat the sodium. Then it's like, oh, hey, you should eat high fat. Right? So, there's, so there's a lot of discussion, but everybody sort of acknowledges that that's a really important thing. What sort of got lost in the whole sort of scheme of things is the sort of when we eat question it sort of became this oh it's not really very important you should eat all the time um because what what had happened in the 70s of course you had the dietary guidelines for americans which recommended a very low fat diet so that was fine but then what happened was that the entire way we ate changed um and it wasn't intentional i don't think even anybody really noticed it but if you look at large national surveys, you can see that in the 70s, people ate three times a day. And by the 2000s, they're eating six, 10 times a day. And it sort of became ingrained into sort of the pantheon of nutritional advice without any evidence, without any studies. Nobody ever did a study and said, hey, eating 10 times a day, we randomize people and they did so much better. Like nobody ever did that. And it just sort of became one of these accepted pieces of wisdom um, with you know, but there was no reason why. Uh, nobody could give me a reason why that would be the case. They made up some reasons like, oh, it keeps your metabolic rate stoked. It's like, I've never seen a study on that, right? It just didn't, didn't exist. Um, there was some stuff on, oh, you shouldn't skip breakfast, which was, of course, largely um, sponsored by the breakfast food companies, right? Mm. And, and, and conflicts of interest is something that's really important because, you know, if you produce a study and say, Coke has a new study that says Coke is really good for you, you'd say, yeah, I don't know if I believe that, right? <laughs> so it was the same thing. So breakfast food companies produce a study that says you should never skip breakfast. You'd be like, yeah, I don't think so. But what of course they did was that they went in and they, you know, sponsored a lot of researchers and doctors to do the study for them. And we know that whoever sponsors the study tends to get the result that they like, no matter who they hire. It just It's just the way it is, right? Uh, because this breakfast company is going to hire the person who is going to be most in their corner, right? And if so, they don't, and if they don't get the result that they like, that study tends not to get published. Yeah, they, they paid for it. So they can do whatever they want with it, right? right? So they can publish it or they can say, throw it in the garbage bin, right? So <laughs> it's sort of like flipping a coin, right? So you flip it heads, you say, hey, we got heads. If it's tails, you don't say anything. So after all, you say, hey, look, you're always getting heads. This coin flip always turns up heads. And then you say, the evidence says this always turns up heads, right? That's because it's a completely biased version of the evidence. You have evidence that is paid for by the company. So anyway, so you had this sort of idea that you should eat, you know, constantly based on these very, very flimsy things, right? And in fact, um, the breakfast, just to finish up the story of the breakfast food companies, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's actually quite striking because there was an article a few years ago when they were trying to look at the most egregious sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, conflicts of interest stories. That was the story they latched on to was the breakfast food company because it was basically like, yeah, every single study produced by the breakfast food companies shows you get these horrible things, you know, oh, your foot will fall off if you don't eat breakfast kind of thing. Whereas every other study done by a not like a not, uh, you know, a, a regular group said, yeah, there's, there's no, there's not no effect here. Right. It was, it was the worst, practically the worst example of conflicts of interest in, in all of science. So that's the study they chose. So it, it, it was quite funny. So, that, so you got all these people saying, you know, the minute you get up, you got to eat, you got to keep eating, keep eating, keep eating. And it was, it's super in the system, right? And, and the snack food companies took it over. So it's this thing where the, the commercial interest said, the snack food companies said, hey, let's just promote the hell out of this. And then we all thought it was great. So you get to the stage where, for example, if you look at schools, so 
when my kids were younger and they'd go on a trip, a field trip or something, right? You'd get this note coming back and say, please pack two snacks for your kids. I'm like, why? Are they not eating lunch? Am I not feeding them dinner? Like, why do they need two snacks from 12 to five when they get home, right? It was ridiculous. But, you know, you practically were, you know, were the worst parent if you didn't send, you know, a candy bar with your kid on a school trip, right? It was like the stupidest thing. And we thought that we were doing so much good for these kids. You get to the point where, you know, you know, you have organized uh, sports like soccer and in the middle of the halves, people think they need to like eat cookies and drink juice, right? It's like, okay, like when did that become healthy, right? It's <laughs> like, it was, but, but, but this whole idea of you must eat all the time, God ingrained. So there's a huge shift from the seventies where you ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner to the two thousands where you just ate like six, seven, eight times a day. So recent studies show that. So if you look at the time that people are eating, the time used to be somewhere around 10 hours. So eight, you know, 8 AM breakfast and 6 PM dinner is about 10 hours, say 11, 10 to 12 hours. And therefore you have a 12 to 14 hour period of fasting. The more recent studies, uh, when they use these apps and they track when, when people actually eat, it's about the time spent eating is about 15 hours, which means the time spent fasting is like nine hours. If you take out the eight hours of sleeping, basically, <laughs> you're eating practically every minute of the day that you're awake. And that's the average. So it, it, it's, it's very, very striking. And the reason it's important, so, so, so we always knew what was important, what you eat was always important. We always debated that. So there's differences of opinion. But the when to eat is, is also very important because it's the way our body is set up. When you eat, you're taking in calories. That's a, that's a form of food energy, right? So when you're taking in calories, your body wants to store it. The way you store it, you can store it as sugar or you can store it as fat. So if you're doing that, you're storing calories, you can't burn those calories in storage because your body is not going to say, well, put calories in and take calories out, right? You're either doing one or the other. It's either going in or it's coming out. Right. So your body is either in the fed state where you're, where you're storing calories or you're in the fasted state where you're burning calories. Right. Mm. And the whole thing is that that's why you don't die in your sleep every single night because you store those calories for a time when you need to use them. So when you don't have any uh, calories coming in, your body says, okay, I have nothing coming in. Let's pull some of it back out. Let's use the sugar that we have, and let's use the body fat that we have, because that is our body's way of storing calories. So what we did in essence was, even though we're eating little bits, little bits, little bits, we're eating all the time. So therefore you're always keeping your body in a state where you're storing calories and you're not giving it any time to use those calories. It's like basically a one-way valve, right? It goes in, but it doesn't come out or you've given it so much less time to come out than you normally would, right? Nine hours instead of, say, 12 to 14 hours. Hmm. And that piles up every single day, right? Day after day after day, you're putting your body in this fed state instead of a fasted state. In the past, your grandmother would have said, well, like, you got to... You know, you got to eat, but then you got to spend a period of time not eating because you got to digest your food. Now we don't think about it that way. We think you just got to keep eating. <laughs> Like there's no spent time spent digesting and there's no time taking those calories back out and using them. So therefore everybody gained weight. Our kids gained weight. Childhood obesity just went crazy. And we're all like, why, why is that? It must be because of what we eat is all mm. wrong. And yes, I think there were some mistakes made there too, but keep in mind that in the seventies, people ate sort of all kinds of different foods. We didn't think about it too much because obesity wasn't a big issue. So people ate white, white bread, people ate white pasta, people ate cookies, people ate ice cream. They didn't eat as much of it and they didn't eat all this time. But the biggest difference I think was the actual meal timing. There's supposed to be a balance there between feeding and fasting, right? You feed, you store energy, you fast, you use energy. If you feed all the time, you're going to find up 
imbalanced, right? And that's where you get the word breakfast from, right? The meal that breaks your fast because you're supposed to feed and then you're supposed to fast. So when I started talking about fasting, so, sort of like eight or nine years ago, uh, people thought that it was crazy to fast, right? And I thought that too at first, but then as you read the research, as you start to understand the physiology, you realize that fasting is actually nothing other than the balance, right? It's the yin and the yang. It's the, you know, it's the feeding and the fasting. You actually have to keep them in balance. If either one is off balance, it's bad. If you're fasting all the time and you're underweight, that's bad, right? If you're feeding all the time and you're overweight, that's bad. So you got to have that proper balance of food. And that's what we have to realize because it's the hormonal state that's, it's, it's the hormones you know, brought on by the feeding that is going to tell our body whether to store calories or to use those calories, right? If, if you don't drop your insulin levels, you can't actually get the calories back out of your system because that's signaling that you actually want to store energy. Yeah, I, I so appreciate that. There's so much there that I want to unpack. But what about, I mean, what about critics who will argue like, Ultimately, it all comes down to the number of calories in versus the number of calories out. <laughs> yeah, that's a really, really simplistic argument. It's actually, um, it's both. It's both the number of calories and it's also sort of what your body is supposed to do with those calories, right? And people always say it's thermodynamics. Anybody who says that actually doesn't understand thermodynamics in any way. Because if you look at the energy balance equation, which is what they talk about, so body fat, which is, remember, just a store of calories, equals calories in minus calories out. Okay, that's always true. Okay. But if you simply, so it is always about those calories, but what they do is they take that energy balance equation, then take the next step, which is completely false, which is, so therefore, you just need to reduce your calories in and you will lose body fat. That's completely not true. Right? Body fat equals calories in minus calories out. There's three variables there. If you drop calories in, you could drop body fat or you could drop calories out. Mm. Either one follows the laws of thermodynamics. And what tells your body whether you should drop fat or drop your body you know, your, 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 your um, calories out, metabolic rate. It's your hormones. Mm. So it's the hormones as well as the calories that are important here. But that's, the hormones are impacted by both the foods that you eat and whether you're eating them or not. So if you're fasting, your insulin level is going to go down, right? So we know, for example, that most people who just try to follow a calorie-reduced diet so they cut 500 calories of their diet and they expect that their body fat will go down. And the calories in, calories out, people say, of course it will. It's just the first law of thermodynamics. It's like, no, you cut 500 calories from your diet. Your body burns 500 calories less. Your body fat is completely unchanged. There's no contradiction here. People say, well, it's just physics. It's like, no, the physics has nothing to do with what your body actually does. And anybody who talks about thermodynamics it really just hasn't thought about it very hard. Anybody who talks about it's just about calories. It's like, it's not just about calories. It's about the calories. But more importantly, it's about the hormones because the hormones tells your body what you're supposed to do. You go back to the 40s. They do these studies on cal uh, semi, they're, they're called semi starvation diets. Hmm. And they put people on these 1500, 15, so the Ansel Keys study, which was 1944, was considered a horrible, horrible, you know, abuse of people. They put hmm. them on these semi starvation diets. You know what it was? It was a 1570 calorie diet of a low fat, high starch food. So low wow. fat diet. That's almost exactly almost exactly what we tell people to eat. Like it's practically word for word. And people's metabolic rates just went into their pipes. People are eating like 2,500, 3,000 calories a day. This is the average American in the 30s and 40s and stuff. 3,000 calories a day. So you tell me if it's all about calories because you can eat 3,000 calories. If you're burning 3,000 calories, your body fat is unchanged. 
And that's, that's, you know, so this whole idea of that, it's all about the calories, like the calories is there, but you're, you're missing the sort of most important thing, which is what your body is doing, which is the hormonal piece of the thing. Mm. Sort of like, uh, you know, if you're to say, oh, well, you know, car, it's all about the gas. It's just the gas. Well, what if you put the gas into your back seat? Does that work? Does your car work? No, it does right. not because you put it in the wrong place. So if you put your calories and if you reduce your calories and your body simply reduces its metabolic rate, which was, by the way, what we know happens, there's like 50 years of research, practically every single study says that when you use a calorie restricted diet, you will actually lower your metabolic rate. So, I mean, if, if you ha- I actually have this all, I, I, I present I, it's on one of my YouTube videos. So I actually have all this, all these studies. It's practically every single study shows that that is what happens. And why? Because they looked at only the calories. They didn't look at what they're doing to the hormonal change. That is the types of food you're eating is going to make a difference. And the way that you're eating it is going to make a difference. So think about it this way, say, some people say, oh, I have to make sure I eat enough calories to lose weight. And it's like, first of all, I don't understand why you would think that because it's completely contradictory. But say you eat, uh, normally eat 2000 calories a day, then you fast. Okay. So you're taking zero calories. Well, what happens to your metabolic rate? Well, that all depends on your hormones. If you're fasting, your body could take 2000 calories out of your body fat because that's where you stored it. Therefore, your metabolic rate doesn't have to go down at all. Hmm. And there's nothing there. There's nothing like it's, it still follows the first law of thermodynamics. Like nobody's breaking any laws of thermodynamics. All those calories, people, they always, I'm always sort of, you know, I'm always sometimes amused and sometimes I just feel sorry for them uh, because they really can't get their heads around that. There's no ther- like there's no thermodynamic laws that are being broken by this hormonal understanding, this physiologic understanding of what happens to our body. That's why that's why I'm so perplexed because it sounds like your stance is inclusive of the energy balance model. Yeah. You're just yeah. also saying that where the source of your calories also matters. Whereas conversely, I f- I, f- I feel like on a number of um, fitness accounts and what you get from the fitness community, and especially those that promote this, if it fits your macros uh, mantra, they tend to ignore the fact that the source of the calories matters. And so your message to me feels very feels very inclusive. And it's not denying that calories matter. It's just also stating that the source of your calories matters as well. Yeah, it's it's the hormones that are really, really important because it tells your body what to do with those calories. That is, if you um, if you eat a lot of calories, people say, oh, calories is the only thing that's important. Well, so if you eat too many calories, then you're going to gain weight. It's like you might gain weight or your metabolic rate might go up. Like we have so many studies that have done this. So a uh, classic study published in the New England Journal by Rudy Leibel, he force fed people basically, um, you know, they used a standard uh, sort of liquid diet. And he basically force fed them. So they're taking in much more energy. What happens to the metabolic rate? Well, it goes up. So the body, the metabolic rate has clearly changed in response to what you've eaten. So it doesn't matter how many calories you either, say you take more calories in, and your metabolic rate goes up, body fat unchanged. Or you take less calories in, metabolic rate goes down, body fat unchanged. So I'm not sure why they think calories is the sort of single most important thing that you need to, to look at. It's, it's, it's a factor, but it's a relatively small factor in my sort of estimation. But I'm not saying it's it's... And this is what it means, right? Because it's like you have sources of calories coming in from all over the place. Like if you are overweight, you might have 300,000 calories of body fat. Well, where is that in your sort of, 
the first law of thermodynamics of where everything comes out, right? It's like, you got to account for that because there's a huge, huge, huge amount stored there. So yeah, I, that's what I think too. It's like, what I'm trying to do is sort of move people past that to look at what's happening physiologically rather than this sort of accounting, you know, calories in, calories out. Therefore, you're going to get this body fat. Well, that's not what happens here. People make the assumption. See, when you have this energy balance equation, body fat equals calories in, calories out, right? Three variables, body fat, calories in, calories out. Okay. So what they do is they say calories out on metabolic rate is stable. It doesn't ever change except for exercise. That's not true. Of course, that's actually completely false. It's, actually, it's been known to be false for 50 years, but that's what they say. So therefore, calories out goes out. And you say, assume that that is a, 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 a fixed variable. Now calories in and body fat will go up and down according to each other. But your initial assumption, which is that this is fixed, is verifiably false. Hmm. Metabolic rate goes down. We know it goes down. Every single person who loses weight finds that out. So, you know, the whole, the whole idea is, is sort of like based on a, this false premise of this fixed calories out. But no, it's three variables. Every study shows that this, the calories in, and this, the calories out, are actually the most highly linked. This is actually far out there. And can be, you know, but it, it, it does depend on like hormones, for example. So, for example, we know that the hormone insulin is a hormone, it's a nutrient sensor. It tells our body that nutrients are coming in. So, it tells the body to store energy and it tells this body not to use its stored energy, right? Energy is coming in, don't use what you've stored. We're putting more into the, into the barrel, right? So insulin inhibits lipolysis. You can't really burn fat when insulin is high because your body is being told not to. Hmm. So if you're not getting the energy out, so again, body fat, calories in, calories out. If you keep your insulin levels very high, as happens in, you know, by eating all the time and eating a very low fat diet, body fat is now fixed because you can't get it out. You lower the calories in, the only way you can balance that equation is your calories out to also go down, right? Three variables. You have to account for all three. You can't just assume one is fixed. If your hormones fix body fat, then calories in and calories out go directly in proportion to each other. Hmm. Calories in goes down, calories out go down. Calories in goes up, calories out goes up. It all depends on what happens to the first variable. Right. And that's, you know, if you're just listening to it, it might be difficult to sort of get your head around that. But, but the point is that there's three variables that can change. So, therefore, changing one variable doesn't necessarily change the other variable. It could change the third one. Right. Why does our metabolism slow down once we start to cut calories? And is there any way to circumvent that physiologic fact? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Like fasting is a great way. So if you look at studies of fasting, when you take people and you fast them and you say, okay, let me measure your metabolic rate at time zero. And then do, a, you know, this has been done. You do a study and four days later, you say, what's your metabolic rate after four days of no food? Your metabolic rate has gone up by about 10%. Hmm. And it's pretty easy to understand why. What happens when you fast is that your insulin goes down and other hormones go up. And these are counter-regulatory hormones. So that includes sympathetic nervous uh, system activation or adrenaline growth hormone. So essentially, your body is actually revving itself up during the fast, and therefore, your metabolic rate has gone up. That's in the short term. When you do it long term, you have to see. But it all comes down to your hormones. Everything in our body is fixed by the hormones. So what we're saying is that fasting is not only about just the calories, because obviously you are eating fewer calories when you, you're fasting. It's at the same time the lesser of lesser important of the two, we'll say. So what are some foods then that we should seek out? And what are some foods that we should avoid if uh, maintaining a high metabolic rate um, is something that we, that we 
strive for? Yeah. So if essentially what you want to do then is to have an adequate period of fasting, which includes uh, sort of cutting out the snacks and so on. And it, it, it all comes down to, you know, and, and, and not all of this is known, but we know that if you're, you know, you, you allow insulin to go down and your counter regulatory hormones to go up, those are going to tend to keep your metabolic rate higher. Right. So, so the sympathetic nervous system is, is it, it, it basically activates your body. It's this sort of fight or flight response. So you get frightened, your body floods with energy and that's, that's the sympathetic nervous system. So when you activate it, as with fasting, you're going to tend to keep your metabolic rate higher because your, your, your body is now in this, in this mood to push out energy from storage into, into your body. So therefore you're going to want to eat foods that are relatively low in terms of insulin. So you're going to want to eat, um, you know, proteins and fats predominantly, right. Um, and keep your carbohydrates lesser, but even amongst the carbohydrates, there's a big difference, right? So if you look at the glycemic index, remember the glycemic index is an index of how high your blood glucose goes after certain food. It actually doesn't apply to predominantly uh, protein or fat foods because the glycemic index really applies to carbohydrate-contained foods. But there's actually a big splay. There's a big variation. Processed carbs, just insulin just spikes way up. So if you're eating corn flakes and white bread and all that kind of thing. But if you're eating relatively unprocessed foods, uh, you know, even though they're carbs, beans and so on, you get a much, much, much lower spike uh, in insulin. So you're ben- basically, if you want to keep your metabolic rate high, it's basically... Uh, eat natural food. So, you know, uh, I won't say you have to avoid carbohydrates completely, but you want to eat sort of as unprocessed and as natural as you possibly can. And you want to cut out the snacks and you want to eat probably, you know, two to three times a day and make sure you have an adequate fasting period. And that is what's going to keep your metabolic rate high, which is, of course, how people ate in the 40s, 50s, and 60s when a lot of Americans were eating sort of 2,500, 33,000 calories a, a day. I mean, they thought 1,570 calories. It was a, I remember thinking this is, this is so strange because it's like, uh, this was the study. It's done in 1944. Um, and 1,570 calories represented a 30 to 40% decrease in their usual intake. Hmm. Right. So that's kind of a lot. That means, you know, it was so, so people were, were up there. And if you look at um, some earlier studies from the 20s and the stuff, there was a lot of people eating like 3000 calories because they do these studies and they say, oh, you know, we severely reduce their calories and they're on like 2000 calories. A day. Wow. And it's like, wow, they're eating a lot. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, going back to the glycemic index. Um, one of the foods that I think many people believe to be healthy, whole wheat bread, right? Has a glycemic index on par with table sugar. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, and the glycemic index doesn't tell you the whole story because of the effect of the fructose. Fructose is, and I think most people agree, sugar and fructose is generally very bad for you from a metabolic standpoint, but it's glycemic index is zero. It doesn't raise the blood glucose at all because it's a different sugar completely. It's a fructose. Um, and that's why table sugar is not as high as as uh, some things, actually. I think it's like a 60 or something. And, so, and there are higher foods than sugar, even though you'd think sugar would be the highest. Um, but yeah, whole wheat bread was one of these things that everybody thought would be good for you. I mean, there's a bit of fiber in there and stuff, but the thing is that it's still highly, highly processed in that um, I think a lot of it is the way they process the wheat. That is, it gets ground up into this very, very fine dust. Like if you look at flour, it's very fine, right? So you throw it up in the air, it sort of spreads. So it's very fine. And when it's very fine, it gets absorbed very quickly, which means mm. it's very quick insulin response. I mean, it's the same reason like cocaine and stuff, people snort it. It's because it's a fine powder. It goes, goes and gets absorbed very quickly. That's why people do it. Same thing with the flour. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it was supposed to be healthy for a while, but it's probably not as healthy as you really thought. And, and, and of course, a lot of people have now gone away from that. They've gone to whole grains and, you know, other, other types of, um, things. So. 
Yeah, the processing of the of the uh, flour, which you mentioned, um, is is a super important consideration to make. There was a study, I forget um, the you know the the author uh, you know in order to cite it, but I do remember that it was a study involving some kind of wheat based porridge, and the only thing that was different after controlling for the carbohydrate quantity. Um, in each of these two different types of porridges was the consistency of the flour. So one was a more finely ground flour, one was more coarse. And I believe what they found in the finely ground flour was that it sent blood sugar and um, it sent blood sugar much higher. The area under the curve for blood sugar was much higher and it caused blood sugar to dip below da- baseline um, yeah, as a result, whereas cool. the coarsely ground flour didn't. And these were the same, it was the same amount of carbohydrate, same carbohydrate bolus in each case, but it was just what determined the effect was how finely ground the flour yeah. was. I mean, this is the thing that people say, well, we've been eating bread for centuries. And it's like, yes, but there's two considerations there. One of them is that the wheat is not produced the same. It's not grown the same. And that was one of the things that uh, Bill Davis in, in his book uh, talked about, right? So, and, and nobody knows the effect of that. So if you, you know, if you haven't read it, what he's saying is that wheat, you know, those stalks of wheat, the way they used to be grown is quite different. In the 60s, there was this so-called green revolution and in the Green Revolution, there is, of course, a worry at the time about world hunger and world starvation because uh, we couldn't produce enough food to feed our population. So what they did was they um, sort of uh, hybridized wheat, and then they wound up with this dwarf wheat. And dwarf wheat is advantageous for several reasons, because the stalk is much shorter, the head doesn't fall over. And because you have a huge head, <laughs> and that's where the wheat comes from compared to the stock, which is just garbage, basically, um, you get more flour per thing. So you went and now dwarf wheat and semi-dwarf wheat sort of replace regular wheat in about, say, 99% of the world's you know, wheat producing regions. So you went from wheat, which we had been eating, to this completely sort of hybridized um, wheat and nobody had studied it. Like, was it the same? Was it not the same? Nobody knew at all. We just accepted, hey, wheat is wheat and therefore you can eat it. So the type of wheat, and, and that's why some people start talking about ancient grains and talking about certain strains of wheat when they go into the, the bakery and so on. And the, um, the whole, so the type of wheat changed and then the way you ground it was different. So remember, all the way up until recently, you had stone grinding. So you you had a big mill and you'd grind it between two stones. And if you've ever had stone ground bread, which you can buy, I mean, it's easily available now. It's much coarser. Mm. (laughs) It's quite different than, than, you know, commercially produced wheat because they're using a uh, very modern sort of flour mill as opposed to two stones grinding on top of each other. You can imagine that you don't get nearly the same amount. And at a microscopic level, I think that the the, the difference in microscopic size is actually a massive, massive difference between stone ground and the other. So anyway, that's, so there is a difference, I mean, between the types of wheat and the way it it is made. So it's, it's a huge, huge, huge difference. And, And we don't even look at that. We say, well, it's just, Bread. It's like no, no, no. There's, there's all these intricacies uh, within it that that you have to understand, um, you know, because they they do make a difference. But the point is that you know, if you if you stick to sort of more unprocessed foods, unfortunately, bread is moving into that sort of more processed, highly processed uh, sort of uh, food as opposed to sort of a more natural uh, food. Yeah, I mean uh, that study, at the very least. Um supports your thesis which is that calories are not all that matter right because in this study the calories were controlled for it was just the the processing that was different there was another study that found that um the degree of processing also affected the thermic effect of a given food bolus right wasn't there a study that found that um digestion the digestion of a minimally of a more of of a less processed food led to a higher thermic effect than a more yeah, processed that's food? just the energy that it takes to um to digest it so you look at 
bread or flour, for example, white flour. I mean, all the hard work's been done already. I mean, it's sort of like comparing orange juice and an orange, right? Orange juice is concentrated. The sugar is just right there for full absorption, right? It goes in you. Like the moment you drink it, it's practically 100% absorbed, you know, as opposed to an orange, which has the same juice, but there's pulp and there's the pith and there's the skin and there's all this stuff that your body has to do. So in order to process it, the thermic effect of food is just how hard it has to work. Um, and some people think it makes a big difference in terms of um, the energy, but I think it's more than just the energy expenditure. It's more the it was the quickness of the absorption, right? So if you spike up your glucose very high, your insulin is going to have to follow in order to keep the glucose down. And that, in it, you know, is probably not a great thing. And you mentioned this sort of sort of where it spikes up high and then goes below baseline, which is what happens when you get this, right? And that's, I think, very, very common. I think that's, uh, you know, you can get reactive hypoglycemia, but I think what happens more is that you just get hungry. So you eat that, you know, two slices of white bread with jam in the morning. By 10.30, you're starving. So you go get yourself a low-fat muffin, and by 12, you're hungry again. Why? Because everything went up, went into... So again, if you think about it, what happens is you take, say you take 200 calories of, of white bread and jam versus 200 calories of eggs or scrambled eggs or omelet or something. So if that 200 calories of white bread and jam goes in, gets absorbed immediately, and glucose spikes way up, what happens? Well, insulin tells you all those calories to go into storage. So now all 200 calories immediately goes into your fat cells because that's what you've just told it to do. Well, by 1030, it's like, there's no more energy left for people, right? So your body's like, okay, I need more energy. Let's go get a low fat muffin. And then mm -hmm. the same thing happens. The energy, the 200 calories you got from the muffin, sugar spikes way up, insulin spikes way up, insulin shoves all that energy away. Right. So you no longer have access to use. Your body can't use those calories because it's gone. It's in storage. So then at lunchtime, you're hungry. So you go get yourself a big plate of pasta, low fat pasta. And the same thing happens because this is what happens uh, physiologically. The egg, for example, or the omelet or, you know, whatever you're eating, it goes in. Instant doesn't go way up. So all that energy kind of sticks around, sticks around, sticks around. So you're not hungry. So you don't have to go get yourself a low-fat muffin. Same 200 calories, but it lasts you till lunchtime. So you didn't mm. have to take it. So it's, it's, it's not just the calories that's important. You see that it's the hormonal state of things that has led you to go and get 200 more calories from that low-fat muffin. But it's the way you eat it, it's the way you process it, and it's everything. It's not Everybody likes to say it's just about willpower. It's like, no. Why you eat more is, is, is a state of your hunger, which is a state of your hormones. It's not like, you know, this obesity epidemic, we know there's an epidemic. It's like, it's not the same. It's not an epidemic of low willpower. I do not believe that people have less willpower now than they used to have. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. I think it's a factor of the way we eat has changed the hormonal responses, right? You eat different foods, your body reacts in a different way. So when you eat the food, when you eat the, the white bread and jam, the hormonal response in your body is completely different than when you ate that vegetable omelet. So you can pretend that those hormones make zero difference because we can measure these hormones. We can measure insulin. We can measure all these insulin. Uh, we can measure all these hormones. So you would have to pretend like those hormones are completely irrelevant. But it's like our body, whole body, the entire signaling system is based on hormones. That's what tells our body what to do. So why would you say it's all about the calories, which is mm -hmm. energy? It's about the energy and it's about the hormones. So I, I, I say that food contains two things. One is energy. That's the food energy and that you can measure, but it also contains information, which is the hormonal response to those foods, which tells your body what to do. So the food contains the calories and it contains the information as to what to do with those calories, right? If you take that energy, like if you do a thought experiment, say I take 200 calories and immediately push it into my fat stores without going through the stomach or whatever, what's going to happen? You're still going to be hungry. 
because your body has no energy, right? Your body wants energy, but you've just shuttled 200 calories directly into your fat stores. Well, nothing's changed. Your blood sugar is still low. You still want energy. You still want to go eat, right? So that's the, you know, that's the point. You have to look at the whole calorie story with a little bit more nuance and you have to sort of go past that to say, well, you know, so if this is what's happening, I'm eating super highly refined carbs, insulin spiking up, which is immediately shuttling all those calories, which my body wants to use. It's immediately shuttling it into my fat stores. And now I need to, now I'm hungry. And I think by the way, that is why we wound up eating six times a day because you know, you ate in the morning, but everybody ate low fat. So then by 10 30, they're hungry. Now all of a sudden they're eating six times a day, but they said, but I'm eating what people said, which was a low fat meal. So therefore <laughs> eating six times a day must be good, but it never was. It was all based on the fact that we cut fat out of our diet when we were out, probably shouldn't have been so, you know, so much like that. But yeah, yeah I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's, it's a much more complex story than, than the calories. People try and make it simple. Oh, it's simple. It's just calories in, calories out. It's like, yeah, yeah you never thought about it that hard then, did you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just reminds me, uh, or it makes me think of when you travel around to hotels domestically in the United States, oftentimes you'll, be, you'll get offered uh, what they call a continental breakfast, which, which usually includes a bowl of oatmeal, uh, a cup of fruit, maybe a glass of orange juice. Now, on first glance, that might appear to be a totally healthy way to start the day, right? Fruit. What could be healthier than fruit, right? Bowl of oatmeal. We've been told for decades at this point that oatmeal is one of the best foods that we can eat for our cardiovascular health. But when you go to the supermarket, you'll see boxes of oatmeal with the red heart healthy logo on it, right? And a glass of orange juice. There's nothing more pure and uh, and delicious than and healthy than starting your day with a glass of orange juice, right? It's got 120% yeah. of your daily needs for vitamin C. But that breakfast, <laughs> what you're saying is that that's probably one of the worst ways to start the day. Yeah, and it all depends on what else you eat during the day uh, also, right? So if it's on top of sort of, you know, full lunch and a full dinner. I mean, that's probably not the best thing, but certainly eating all those highly refined foods. I mean, in Europe, they do, of course, that's where the term continental comes from. Although I'll tell you in, in, in like a lot of places, they, they often don't eat breakfast, right? You go to Italy, for example, you know, and I have some friends, they're like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's a coffee. And you know, when they mean coffee, they mean that little espresso, which is like the sip, right? And that's their breakfast. They're like, oh, that's, your breakfast okay so that's why people say oh it's a big american breakfast that's what they mean uh by that uh, so so but they do that sometimes in france right you have a croissant and stuff but it's like you look at the rest of it like the cultural norms plays a big big role in in this sort of thing and you look at their the size of the meals like if you travel around the world you know it's like you go to i remember i went to asia once and the portions are small, small, small. It's, it's like, whoa. So then eventually you just, that's that you just go with it. And, and I think if you live there long enough, you go with it. Right. But you know, if you, if you have that sort of uh, continental breakfast, but then eat a full sort of North American level lunch and dinner. Yeah. That's probably not so good for you. If you eat sort of really small portions, like you get in Japan and stuff like that. Right. And you're paying through the nose. So you don't want to buy any, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the other secret right it's like you go over to some of these places and it's like the prices are like insane compared to what we pay in north america so it's like okay there might not be enough food but i just paid like twice what i normally pay so that's it i'm not eating anymore because it's just way too expensive i'd rather go a little bit hungry right so, <laughs> um so yeah i mean i think you do have to look at that so that's why uh, uh, for us it's it's definitely you have to look at that in, in context with what, you, what else you're eating. But yeah, that's not the best foods to be eating. No. Yeah. I mean, I, per, I find anecdotally when I travel, whenever I'm in Europe um, or even South America where I've spent some time, hotel breakfasts tend to, they tend to be way more inclined to include some kind of protein source. You know, in Europe, especially in Northern yeah. Europe, you get a lot of um, fish options like smoked salmon, mm -hmm. um, eggs. I mean, even, even like 
the humble hard boiled egg, you'll, f- I think you're more likely to find in a breakfast overseas than in the United States. In the U S it's just yeah. like we, we've gotten so used to this low protein, low fat idea of what constitutes yeah. a healthy breakfast. Yeah. Like the eggs. I mean, eggs were a sort of staple of breakfast and they're completely gone. Like most people don't even eat it, right? Their their idea of of breakfast, like it almost doesn't include eggs anymore. But it's like, gosh, I mean, that was sort of the the regular for for so so long. But it, it's true. I think I think it's true. I mean, I don't have data, but um, I think it's definitely true. We went so far into that low fat, and the problem is, of course, uh, low fat often means low in protein as well. And then there's this whole other sort of. Um, bend, which is the sort of vegetarianism, veganism sort of mix, which tends to make things a lot lower in protein than, than, than if you're, if you're eating sort of, um, not that way. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have any problem with it, but, uh, you know, definitely protein is, is sort of an important uh, part of the mix. Yeah. Well, I think that my listeners and viewers are going to have a really a much more clear idea now of of what to start their day with in terms of foods, you know, prioritizing protein, getting in some healthy fats, not uh, in, ingesting some kind of like highly refined glucose bomb, steering clear of that. Uh, in terms of when people should be having their first meal, because I know you're not a big fan of of breakfast, but when should people break the fast? I don't think it matters that much. Like mm. if you want to eat breakfast, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If you don't want to eat breakfast, I also don't think that there's anything wrong with it. And, and um, you know, you can do very well eating three meals a day. I mean, as long as you're cutting out sort of the, the, the stuff that's really going to impact you. And, and, you know, some people use the, you know, other than pro- proteins and fats, really going towards, you know, what they call slow carbs, right? And, and that's a pretty decent term. You want sort of stuff that's going to stick around and get really slowly as opposed to the big spikes. Um, so those are all, those are all good things. But it really is personal preference. I don't think that there's actually any, any major difference because our bodies are so, so much smarter than we give it credit for. If you eat, your body will handle it, right? It knows what to do. If you don't eat, your body knows what to do as well, right? So if you don't eat, like you, you, you don't like breakfast. Like I don't, I often don't eat breakfast because I'm not used to it anymore. So I, I go until lunchtime or whatever. Well, your body knows what to do. It just keeps taking the calories out of your storage your body fat, your glucose, that's all that happens. There's nothing else that happens. Like everybody pretends that there's some magic of putting a muffin in your mouth at 7 a.m. Like nothing, there's nothing magical about that muffin at 7 a.m. It's just a source of calories. Your body can take that same source of calories from your body fat because that's what it is. It's the calories that you stored from previously, from food you ate previously so so you can eat any time you want so you know if you like it then then i don't think you need to stop i don't think that there's any reason to um but if you if you don't like it then there's no reason to do it which was really the sort of what had happened right people who didn't want to eat breakfast were always scolded that you gotta eat breakfast make sure you never skip it especially diabetic don't skip a meal make sure you have three meals and three snacks and it's like well you know, every single time you eat, asserting you're assuming you're eating sort of a mix of uh, macronutrients, your blood glucose is going to go up. So why would you want to have your blood glucose spike six times a day instead of twice a day? Like that mm-hmm. doesn't even make sense from from you know any any. <laughs> Uh, sense of the imagination. I mean, the basics of nutrition are relatively like we kind of know it, right? It's like try to eat unprocessed food. Nobody disagrees with that. Try and eat less sugar. Nobody disagrees with that. Eat lots of vegetables. I don't think lots of many people disagree with that. Uh, and the other thing which I would add is don't eat all the time if you want to lose weight. Like that's it. Like to me, it's pure common sense. Right. And if you want to eat breakfast, if you don't want to eat breakfast, it's okay. You can do it if you want. Just stick to those sort of um, rules, unprocessed foods. Like if you're getting, you know, a Danish out of one of those plastic (laughs) wrappers, then you're so much better off by not eating it. But if you're eating sort of like a couple of hard boiled eggs, then you may well be better off eating that breakfast and, 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 you know, not being hungry and getting something down the line. Right. So it all comes down to that, right? Like people, 
you, you always have to look at the whole sort of uh, picture. So, uh, but but the general rule is still the same. Like uh, eat unprocessed, eat healthy. Um, you know, but don't 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 worry about that uh, the the littler stuff so much. Yeah, I think a lot of people eating that Danish probably getting it, probably doing it more because of the convenience factor. Of yeah, and that's that the problem with breakfast, right? Yeah, because everybody's in a rush at breakfast time. I always was in a rush at breakfast time. That's why I stopped eating breakfast. But that's the point, right? You want to you wind up with cold cereal, like processed, super highly processed frosted flakes or something like that, right? And you ate it because somebody, well-meaning dietitian, said, "Don't ever skip breakfast." So you go, "Oh, I must eat something. I'm going to eat this Danish." Right? So you open up the plastic wrap. It's like, oh, that's so bad. <laughs> you're mm. just so you're you know so you took this piece of advice and then you, you turned it around and wound up way worse than if somebody said well if you can eat a healthy breakfast then go ahead if you can't then you're better off not yeah i so appreciate that what about like just because we're we're we've touched on the topic of convenience protein shakes and things like that like like hyper convenient um yeah, ways to start the again, day I generally steer people away from any type of processed stuff. So whether it's a processed carbohydrate or processed protein or processed fat, I generally think you're better off steering away from it. You know, protein shakes and stuff, like everything always sounds like a good idea. And then they find out later on that is a really bad idea. It's sort of like infant formula. Remember, there's this whole thing where we told people not to breastfeed their kids because we could make a better processed formula. Right? Mm. And then of course it took a huge effort. Like as, as strange as it sounds now, <laughs> I don't know if you, you remember, but there, it took a huge effort of this whole campaign called breast is best to get people back to breastfeeding. Cause there was a 20 year period where mothers would feed their children formula because they thought it was the best thing for them. Completely wrong, okay? Like totally wrong. But it, it actually took a massive coordinated effort to get people bas- back to breastfeeding, which is like, oh, it's so much healthier for you. You can feed anytime. It's better for the kid. It's better for you. And it's free. It's like you had to have that many advantages <laughs> to go back. Um, So anything processed to me is always highly suspect because I think our bodies are generally built for, um, you know, the natural foods. That's what we've evolved on. So if you're eating these whey powder, it's like, well, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I can't say for sure they're bad for you, but I, I, I would probably just as a sort of general heuristic, it'd be like, if it's highly processed like that, I would avoid it. I would think that it's bad for you. You're better off going to eat. If you want it, go eat a piece of steak or go eat cheese or go eat whatever it is that you want to eat and stay away from that protein shake or process anything else, right? So anything else processed that you put in that blender with that shake, right? Uh, don't take it. Like it's, it's just a general sort of rule that, that works very well because sometimes it takes you years to get back to figure out how bad it actually is. It's like the margarine and butter thing, right? Mm. Oh, here's a better processed fat called margarine. (laughs) It wasn't better for you at all. It took 20 years before we figured out it was actually causing heart attacks. Right. It's uh, so, uh, you know, uh, while I'm not totally against these sort of things, I'm always like, well, if you need the convenience, then just don't eat. You're better off just doing that. And then when you have time, go get yourself a steak, which is a lot of protein, but it's natural protein. Your bodies will know how to handle it. Yeah. I like that you're being, that you're consistent with your message. I think that's, that's important. I tend to do, um, whey protein shakes occasionally. Um, but I do know that there's no such thing as a, as a free, free lunch, so to speak, when it comes to nutrition and that a lot of whey protein powders, um, have been shown to contain high levels of, of pollutants, like of, uh, of contaminants. Um, so have vegan protein powders. So I think everything has to be, uh, approached, um, you know, critically. Yeah. And, and, and people always sell you this idea that it's healthier for you. Whereas I always think, well, it's, it's difficult to be healthier than the foods that we, you know, 
are supposed to be eating, right? Which is natural foods. Um, and we can't always do that. So I'm, uh, you know, again, I'm not super negative on, on a lot of these things. Like this, you, you live in the real world. Like you know, sometimes you do wind up eating these things that, you know, aren't that good for you. But uh, on the other hand, if you have a choice, then I would say like some people choose because they think it's healthier to do that, where I always think, well, you should really just choose the natural option yeah. because that's going to, you're going to be more right than wrong if you do that, as opposed to sort of, going with the artificial, you know, highly processed option, because you're more likely to go wrong there, even if you don't know it at the time. Yeah. It's it's still more likely. Sometimes getting a steak is, you know, it's can be a a difficult task. I mean, steak is expensive. People that are busy running out the door or, you know, eating at their desks, not that's not always something that's, that's, uh, available to them. Would you say like, um, like a salad, like, like a salad with some protein. Is that a, is that a good option? Yeah, certainly is a good option. And if you're too busy, then just don't, just don't eat. Right. And that's the point. Like you have lots of calories on your body frame right now. Like, unfortunately that's the case for most of North America. Right. Uh, If you're underweight, of course, then that's a totally different story. But as long as you're above 10% body fat, you've got pounds and pounds and pounds of body fat for you to live off. I mean, when people used to fast, they used to talk about 30 days of fasting. I mean, Mm. you barely even go 30 hours without before somebody freaks out on you. So, you know, you don't always have to, you know, fasting is such an interesting option because it always gives you that option of not eating. Remember, it's just food that you've eaten in the past. You're just taking it back out of storage. That's it. Yes, it's not fun. Yes, it's not tasty. But, you know, it's it's a good option for you rather than having to rely on a convenience thing such as, you know, a shake or a bar or a thing, right? It's It's, and I'm not, I don't even know, like, I would say the same for any bar, whether it's a protein bar or a keto bar or whatever. Of course, yeah. I mean, therefore, it's probably not that good for you uh, in the long term. What about, do you have any hunger hacks? You know, because some people just, they they get hungry. Yeah, for sure you will get hungry. And that's, that's what you have to expect. And one is that you have to understand that the hunger doesn't last. So it will actually go away. Uh, if you, if you let it, uh, so usually it's like a wave, right? You let it ride right over you and let it go. I mean, it's something you can deal with and the longer you go, the easier it is to handle those, those waves. Um, one of the things that most people have, you know, have struggled with is that if they're eating eight times a day and you try to go down to one, it's a huge jump, right? But uh, there's the, the, the hunger is always going to be there. The key is that if you don't do anything about it, you're just going to ride it out. So stay busy, do something else, do something alike. For example, I do these, a lot of these podcasts like now, which is noontime for me, right? So therefore by the time I'm done and then I go into work, I've just skipped my lunch, but it hasn't affected me in any way. Yes. I will get hungry occasionally, but you're busy. You're talking, I'm talking, I'm working. It's done. By the time I think about it again, it's done, right? It's not like, and, and this is where it's very hard with the pandemic, right? If you're hungry and you're working in your kitchen, you're done. Like you're going to get up, you're going to go to the cupboard. Then you're going to see, oh, all I have is a bag of chips. And then you're going to get that bag of chips, right? And so that's why this pandemic has been super bad. I mean, I'm in the office right now. And if I'm hungry, there's nothing to eat. So that's it. I just stick it out and I go home until I go home, right? But if you're sitting at home because you're now forced home is in the pandemic and there is stuff to eat. In fact, there's leftovers and there's cookies in the cupboard and there's chips and stuff. Well, you're done. You're, you, you, you might as well forget it. Right. And that's, that's why some of the, some of the stats coming out of the pandemic are just very bad. Right. Like in terms of weight gain. In fact, I think the millennials did the worst of everybody. It was, I think 30 plus pounds of weight gain. So it, it's not lack of willpower. That's what these sort of calories people, they always say it's all about your willpower. No, there's so much else to it. It's like the environment that you find yourself in. Like that makes a difference. The friends that you keep, that makes a huge difference, right? In fact, if you study obesity, you see that it actually tracks more closely to an infectious disease. Like it's, it's actually almost transmissible. If your friends are, 
obese, you're, you will be more likely to be obese because those, those things, it's, it's not about individual willpower. It's about, you know, the community, the norms where you eat. So eating at home well, or staying at home, you're going to wind up snacking all, all day long and all night long. It's a, it's a bad situation. It's a big problem. I find myself so much more inclined to snack when I'm home versus when I'm out and about running around distracted. And I mean, ironically, when I'm out and about, I'm burning more calories and yet I'm not, I'm not hungry when I'm home. I'm burning fewer calories because I'm just sitting around, but my proximity to the food in my kitchen makes me want to snack all the time. So I I, I love that. It's a real issue. It's a real issue. Like your steps go way down because you're not walking around and your, your intake just goes way up. And the whole thing is just a disaster truthfully, but, uh, you know, hopefully we get to the end of it and then we can get back to sort of some normality. (laughs) Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. Ideally, what I like to see at the end of this process is I would like to see somebody lose 20 pounds, but eat as much or more than they did when they first started with me.